Out of nowhere, I felt this deep, passionate interest to learn Golang, which is a language created by engineers at Google so that they can use it where efficiency and performance is important. To be honest, I don't really understand why would you use Go for servers. I would personally just use Express. Wait, what do you mean JavaScript isn't a good language for backend? I don't think you become the most popular backend language by being bad at it. Oh, it's just flatlined at the bottom, whereas TypeScript goes way up to the tippity top, almost six. Okay, I guess Golang is alright. So now that I know the use case of Golang and how powerful it is when it comes to managing thousands of connections at the same time, I'm gonna go ahead and make a single player game where you go to play Go written in Go. Right off the bat, I downloaded and set up Go on my computer. Then I downloaded a 2D Go game engine called EBIT Engine and to confirm that it works, it asks you to run this simple game which is straight nightmare fuel. But to be fair, I don't think the real problem is the image that is rotating just slow or just fast enough to be creepy. It's the fucking Go mascot. Sure it looks kinda odd but kinda cute when you look at the digital art, but for some reason once they make a plushie out of it, it looks like what I imagine will bite my toes off if I ever sleep with my feet outside the blanket. Anyways, got a quick little Hello World tier game going where I literally printed out hello world to the screen and at this stage I was looking at some sample game examples that can be found directly on EBIT Engine's website. Then I realized I don't really know Go. Bruh. So I'll do the impossible and actually read some documentation to get this game done. Oh, now that I printed out certain variables to the console and fixed my software issue, let me remove them and continue on with my development. Wait, what? Hmm, this isn't scaling, right? Let me remove that scaling from the script. Okay, let's see. Oh, right. Now that I'm not scaling the image anymore, I can't have these two scaling factors. Oh, right. Because I am not calculating the scaling factors anymore, I don't need the width or the height of the image. I'm so sorry, dude. On the program, there is like, you know, some big ass circles. I get it. The circles are big. I scale the images down, as you can see here. So we get, I, I, I want them to be 16 by 16. So I get the width of the image, I divide that, so that's like 0.08, and I scale them down by that, right? So this should work, right? Then what the fuck is this? Okay, they do get smaller, which is perfect, but why are they stuck here? Even worse than that, you can give them speed. You know, they're supposed to bounce around and don't go out of bounds of the screen. They just move here. Why? Then you'll say, okay, just make them bigger, bro. See what happens. I'm like, yeah, I agree. What the hell is this? Now, why are they stopping here? and not even at the full screen and they're going out of bounds clearly. Okay, let's forget about scaling the sprites. I'll just hard code that shit. Draw all the sprites in the exact size I want. It works fine if I don't need to bother with scaling. Wait, what do you mean you have a 4K monitor? I mean, sucks to suck, I guess. I don't know what to tell you. Alright, so the next step is to let the players place the tiles as they click. And as you can see, my mouse clicks were registering perfectly except for the fact that they were being registered 5 times. This was fixed by using the EBIT engine's input utils package, which has the function is he just pressed. Now the player can place tiles, which are in the center correctly, but hold on, give me a second here. Okay, there we go. For the next step, I whipped up a quick Go game board for the vibes, and also some new and better tiles. In Go, you don't really go around placing tiles wherever you want, you need to place them on these intersections. So instead of just randomly placing sprites to render, I started keeping track of the game state in this 9x9 integer map where the draw function draws tiles based on the values of each integer on the map. Ok, time to move on to implementing the rules of Go. Oh my dear god. Alright well, I think these will be enough for this project. Starting with the first rule, I already have the white playing first, so we're chilling. Wait, 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 wait a second. Black goes first. In most old board games I know, aka chess, white player goes first. So I wonder why it's not the same with Go. Turns out, I wasn't the only person who was intrigued by this rule. These redditors said that the stronger player always took the white stones, whether it was because the white stones are rarer, or because culturally the more senior or better player took the white stones in Japan and Korea, or my personal favorite, it is because white is the color of death in Japan, which is why it was given to the stronghold player. This is also anecdotally the most accurate description since I got my ass whooped by a player playing with the white stones. So we can consider this matter settled. Moving on to the rule 4, I first use Aesopride to make a pass button, which I placed on the board and as the name suggests, it passes the turn of the current player. I couldn't really figure out how to make a button in EBIT engine though, so I simply check where the mouse click happens, and if the X and Y coordinates are within the certain ranges, I execute the passing code. So I guess some people will be real upset when they ask me to change the location of the button. 
Moving on to rule 5 which is about piece capturing, describing this will be definitely simpler than implementing it. You can think of these groups of pieces that are all connected to each other like islands. If the other player completely wraps the surrounding area of an island, they capture all the pieces there. Implementing this though was a bit harder. When a stone is placed, I first check for pieces with the opposite color in all four directions. For each matching stone, I call get group in order to find all the other connected stones of the same color. This function uses breadth first search to find all connected stones of the same color. Afterwards, for each group, I call the get liberties function, which checks all the locations adjacent to the group. In this case, a liberty would be an empty spot so that the stones can survive. If there are no liberties found for a particular group, then remove group is called, which simply removes all the tiles that belong in that group, and this is what the end result looks like. Moving on to rule 6, it states that no stone may be played as to recreate a former board position. I implemented this rule by simply turning each board state into a hash using some cryptography packages. So now, every time a stone is placed, I check if the exact same hash was already stored, which can only happen if this board state has existed before as well. Rule 7, two consecutive passes end the game. Yeah, I mean, we definitely need this rule, since right now the game never ends. To implement this rule, I start to track if the last action taken was a turn pass. And if a turn is passed, when that fact is true, the game is restarted. Now I imagine the players will care if they won or lost, so I am not quite done yet. Rule 8. A player's area consists of all the points the player has either occupied or surrounded. They can capture a location by either directly placing a stone on it, which is easy to count, or by indirectly surrounding an empty area, which isn't as easy to count. For the sake of simplicity, I won't implement the arguing back and forth for who captured each coordinate part, but instead, the game will award you all the areas that you have surrounded for sure, and questionable coordinates won't award points to anybody. This rule is implemented by going through each cell, and then for each empty spot, we get the surrounded connected empty spots as a group, check if the whole group is surrounded by one color, and if that's the case, set the values of the board state at those coordinates so the new scare art can be painted in, as well as giving more points to the player. And this is what it looked like at the end. All the basic rules of the board game Go are implemented. Let's see what are we missing here. I made a game where you go play Go written in Go. Well, all this code is written in Golang, and you can indeed play a game of Go, the board game. But wait, you can't go anywhere yet. This part should be much easier. First, the position of the character is tracked, which is both used to render the character on the screen as well as checking if the character has made it to the board game cafe. Once the player steps on the door, the game starts, and rest is business as usual. Here's a quick demo. Oh, you've got to be fu- Let's try again. There we go. And that's it. Now you can play a game where you go to play Go, all written in Go. Now it's time for you to go ahead and like this video and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching, hope to see you next time.